here. I always enjoy AYC. It's one of my favorite places in the world. I always enjoy coming and meeting lots of old friends and catching up again. Especially appreciate the theme that the organizers chose for this year, to rise and build. It comes from, of course, the book of Nehemiah, which has long been one of my favorite books. In uh, Nehemiah, there's many great principles for leadership. And if there ever was a time for leadership, especially young leadership in the church, that time is now, amen? The two parts, rise and build. Rise, uh, an awakening, a, a quickening, a, a revival. And then the build, the action, the ministry. It's launching out and doing something. And these two have to go together to have a balanced Christian experience. This morning, what I'd like to do is just spend a little bit of time talking about the power for both of these, the power to rise and the power to build, where this power comes from. And in particular, I'd like to focus in on the whole subject of the Holy Spirit and how it works in our life. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll turn to the scriptures. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here gathered together to study your word. We recognize that it's the need of the hour to rise and to build, but we need power, the power of your Holy Spirit. Please bless us as we study this morning. We're dependent on you. We're looking to you, and we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24. I'd like to share with you an interesting little curious detail. It's actually a very important verse here in the book of Luke, Luke starting in chapter 24, verse 1, just to get the context, the setting a little bit. Great to hear all those pages turning. Luke chapter 24, verse 1, the Bible says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And you remember the story. This is the immediately after Jesus had been crucified and he had been uh, buried. And then over the Sabbath, he rested. And then early in the morning, they went to go prepare the body and they brought all the spices and things And if you read down through the story, you'll you'll see that Mary and some of the other ladies, they were there and they saw that Jesus wasn't in the tomb anymore. They go back and tell the disciples. Notice verse 13. Talks about the two men on the road to Emmaus. Behold, two of them went that same day, the very same day, that resurrection Sunday, walking back to Emmaus. And you remember again the story, Jesus actually came and walked with them. They didn't recognize him at first. And he begins to go over some of the prophecies, and they get, they get excited. And then finally, they realize it's Jesus that's been there with them, and then they run back to Jerusalem that very same night. So this is the very evening of the resurrection, that Sunday night. Skip down to about verse 36. Back up just a little bit, verse 33. They rose up the same hour after they realized it was Jesus. They returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven gathered together. And they said, the Lord is risen. He's appeared to us. Verse 35. Verse 36, excuse me. As they thus spake, Jesus himself appeared in their midst, and he said to them, peace be unto you. And as you continue down through the chapter, again, just setting the context, Jesus spends a good bit of time trying to convince them that it's really him. Reach out and touch me. Do you have anything to eat? And he starts going through the prophecies, trying to convince them that it really is him. He really is alive. This is that very first day after the resurrection, that Sunday evening. And down near the end, going down to verse 46, here's the point we're getting to. Jesus begins to explain how all of this was prophesied, it was written, it behooved Christ to suffer, to rise from the dead the third day. There's a mission to, re- to preach repentance and remission of sin in all the worlds. Verse 48, you are what? Witnesses of these things. And here's the verse I want to focus in on. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but 
tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. The very first day of the resurrection, Jesus comes to his disciples. He says, peace be unto you. And he says, wait, tarry, hold on just a little bit. Stay here in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. And of course, that power was poured out 50 days later on the day of Pentecost. Amen? Now, keep your finger here in this passage and flip over with me to John chapter 20. Because in John chapter 20, we have just a little bit different account of the exact same meeting with the disciples there in the upper room. But something different happens here in John chapter 20. I I don't know exactly why. It seems like for one reason Luke remembered some details and John remembered other details. And so when we compare Scripture with Scripture, we get a little bit fuller picture. John chapter 20, notice again verse 1. First day of the week. Mary Magdalene comes early to the sepulcher. They see the stones rolled away, and you can read down through the chapter. The very exact same day. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week. This is that resurrection Sunday. The doors were shut. The disciples were assembled there in that upper room for fear of the Jews. And suddenly Jesus appeared in their midst. And what does he say? Same thing we read in Luke. Peace be Unto you. This is the exact same meeting between Jesus and the disciples. Now notice the next couple verses. He shows him his hands. He shows him his side. The disciples finally realize it's the Lord. They're glad. That's verse 20. And then verse 21 says something very interesting. Compare this with what it said in Luke. Verse 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Verse 22, When he had said this, He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now in in Luke, it sounds like Jesus is saying, You need to wait until the Holy Spirit is poured out. Wait until you're endued with power. But in John, he remembers another detail. John remembers that Jesus actually breathed on them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost that very night. Have you thought about that? Kind of like there's a little discrepancy here. You know, I don't know all the details of exactly what's happening here, but it seems to me like Jesus was blessing them with a certain measure of the Holy Spirit that very night. But he said there's a greater measure that's going to come very soon, and you need that. See, if you think about it, the Holy Spirit had already been working in those disciples' life, hadn't, hadn't it? I mean, the Holy Spirit had been leading them and guiding them and convicting them and teaching them, helping them to understand things. Yes, they were a little slow. Yes, they were a little dense sometimes. But the Holy Spirit had been working with them all through that time. And there in the upper room, when they finally realized that Jesus was alive, he said, he breathed on them. He said, receive you the Holy Ghost. I believe they had a measure of the Holy Spirit at that point. But that very same night, when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost, that very same night, He says, but you need to wait until you get an even greater endowment of the Holy Spirit. Wait until you're endued with power from on high. I think, as I consider these two accounts of that evening on the resurrection day, I think there must be some difference, some distinction between just the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, and I'm thankful for that, but there's a difference between the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life and the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. You can read about what happened in Acts chapter 1. What happened when the Holy Spirit was poured out with power. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8. This is Jesus just before his resurrection. This is 40 days later. He had been meeting with them for some time. He says, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? There's that word again. In other words, the disciples had the presence of the Holy Spirit working in their life, but they couldn't really become witnesses until they had what? The power of the Holy Spirit. 
And that power was poured out on this very day, and, and, or 10 days later actually, and on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection, the Holy Spirit was poured out without power. And, and you remember the whole story, Peter and John, they start preaching, and, and, uh, and they're, men, men, they're convicted in the heart, what do we have to do to be saved? And he says, repent and be baptized, and the Bible says the same day, 3,000 souls were added into the church. The power of the Holy Spirit, when it was poured out, their witness became effective, and many, many people were converted to the truth. The Holy Spirit had been working in their life for years. And even before they met Jesus, I'm sure the Holy Spirit was working and guiding and preparing them. And during those three and a half years that they traveled around with Jesus, I'm sure the Holy Spirit was making impressions and, and guiding them and transforming their lives. And after the resurrection, they finally began to understand what the gospel was all about and what Jesus had accomplished. And it, and it began to sink in. And they're there in that upper room for those last ten days after Jesus ascended. And they're praying and they're searching their hearts. and confess The Holy Spirit was working in their life, no question about it. But Jesus said, you have to wait until you not only have the presence of the Holy Spirit, but you also have the power of the Holy Spirit if you're going to be effective as a witness. Notice uh, another example of this, uh, Acts chapter 4, just a couple chapters later. Many people were coming to the truth. They had arrested Peter and John once, and they... And they beat them, and they told them, don't preach anymore in his name. They released them. And notice the very first thing they do, Acts chapter 4, verse 23. Being let go, they went to their own company, that is, they went to the other Christians, and they reported everything the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, your God, you made heaven, earth, and sea. And they begin this prayer. And if we skip down, just for the sake of time, skip down to the end, verse 29, now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness, or we might say with all power, they may what? Speak thy word. They've just threatened us. They've just beaten, beaten us. We need more boldness. We need more power. We need more of your Holy Spirit. This is just two chapters after Pentecost. Verse 31, when they had prayed, the place was what? Shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the Word of God with boldness, or we could say with power. See, this wasn't just a one-time thing. They prayed, they pleaded with God, they agonized with God, and the Holy Spirit was poured out with, with power. And they were able to preach with incredible effectiveness. I wonder sometimes if we don't operate in our individual lives, in our ministry, we have the presence of the Holy Spirit working, but we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that possible, do you think? I think it is. There's another interesting passage. Turn, turn me back to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. I remember noticing this once many years ago, and it just struck me as so curious. Luke chapter 4, now we're turning from the disciples to the life of Jesus himself. And notice how the chapter begins. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. This is immediately after Jesus' baptism. Verse 1, it says, Jesus being what? Full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So at this point in his life, Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. No question about it. Now as you read down through the next 10 or 12 verses, you realize that Jesus goes through this 40 days of fasting and praying and, and uh, wrestling with God and whatever was happening there. The devil comes and tempts him. And you remember the whole story. But notice what happens after that period. Skip down to verse 13. When the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in what? What does it say? In the power of the Holy Spirit. Now it's interesting that before this time, as far as we know, there, were, there was not a single miracle that Jesus had performed. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit from conception, from the very beginning. There was never a time he wasn't filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was constantly there in his life. But something happened during those 40 days when he was alone agonizing with the Father that transformed him. That He now, now, now just didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit, but he had the power of the Holy Spirit, and his ministry just explodes. In fact, notice the rest of the verse. He returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. Everywhere we're talking about Jesus. Something happened. Something changed in his ministry. 
You know, I, I've noticed this in my own personal experience. There are, are times when we just push and push and push and try to accomplish something for the Lord, and it just seems like we're just beating our head against a brick wall and nothing's happening. But then there's other times where the Holy Spirit is just poured out with special power, and your ministry just explodes without, without you almost doing anything. There's, there, a fame just went out. Something happened to Jesus' ministry. It was transformed because now he didn't just have the presence of the Holy Spirit, but he had the power of the Holy Spirit. There's actually some amazing passages. This is a theme that kind of runs through the New Testament. I hadn't always noticed it. Notice Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Starting at the beginning of the chapter. This is just after Stephen was stoned. And Saul, who had later become Paul, was convicted, and he went on a rampage to try and persecute the believers. At that time, there was a great persecution against the church, and they were scattered abroad, different places. Notice verse 5. One of the individuals that was scattered during this time was a deacon by the name of Philip. It says he went down to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, the, the, the presence of the Holy Spirit was there. And they were listening, they were convicted, they believed what Peter was saying. The Holy Spirit was working in their lives. Amen? In fact, notice verse 12. When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Would you say that the presence of the Holy Spirit is working in someone's life? If they're listening to a message, they're convicted about it, they believe the message, they make a decision for baptism. Isn't that a wonderful blessing of the presence of the Holy Spirit? But the Bible continues to say something very interesting. Look, notice the next verse. Excuse me, verse 14. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, and that's a work of the Holy Spirit, no question about it. The presence of the Holy Spirit was there. They heard that the men in Samaria, the men and women there, had received the, the word of God. They sent Peter and John... Verse 15, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive what? Now, they already had the Holy Spirit, didn't they? I mean, the Holy Spirit was already there. It was already working. They had already made a decision for Christ. They had been baptized. Notice the next verse. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then laid their, their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. In other words... They had a measure of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit was there. But they needed the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder sometimes if we're not very much like these Samaritan believers. We have the presence of the Holy Spirit working. We, we know. We know the Holy Spirit is convicting and leading us and helping us. And there's changes that are taking place in our life. And we look back and, and we, we know the Holy Spirit is working in our life. But there's no power. There's no power. Another story. Look at Acts chapter 19. This is one of my favorite stories in the book of Acts. If we had time, we would do a little survey of the New Testament, and we would discover that everywhere the gospel went, the churches were exploding by leaps and bounds. Just people were flocking into the church every day. The Lord was adding to the churches daily. Not just in Jerusalem, but all over. But the interesting little account here in Acts chapter 19, G, uh, Paul is traveling and came, comes to pass that Paul passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and he found a number of disciples. In fact, it says there were 12 of them. And as soon as John, uh, excuse me, as soon as Paul meets these 12 guys, he looks at them, and, and something doesn't quite seem right to them, and, and he asks this question, says, have you received the Holy Ghost? Uh, now you are believers. You, you seem to be uh, disciples. But have you, haven't you received the Holy Ghost? I wonder why he asked that question. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, why did he just see this little group of 12 guys, and all of a sudden something's like scratching the back of his arm, like, haven't you guys received the Holy Ghost? I mean, here's my take on it. I don't know exactly what motivated him to ask the question, but it seems to me like the churches everywhere where there was the power of the Holy Ghost were exploding. 
And he comes to Ephesus, which is one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire, the fourth largest city. In the, and he sees there's only 12 of these guys. He says, what's wrong with you? How come there's only 12 of you? How come there's just a, a little group of you? Haven't you received the Holy Ghost? Haven't you experienced the power of the Holy Spirit yet? What, what's wrong? How come there's only 12 of you? I wonder, you know, if we look at some of our churches... If Paul were to visit this church and that church and there's 20 or 30 here, just a little small group, and they've been there for 40 years or 50 years or 100 years or however long, and it's like, what's wrong with the church? Haven't you received the Holy Ghost yet? Haven't you received the power of the Holy Spirit yet? I wonder if Paul would ask that same question today if he were to visit some of our churches. Well, you can go down and, and read. turns out that these men hadn't even heard about Jesus. They had just heard about John the Baptist. They had been baptized into repentance. So it says in uh, verse 4, he explains that John was preaching a baptism of repentance and that Jesus was going to come after him, and he preaches to them Jesus. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 6, Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they began to preach with power. And if you read the rest of this chapter here in Acts 19, what happened in Ephesus was absolutely amazing. There was an explosion of the church in Ephesus. Powerful. Now, I don't want to make too big a, a deal of this, okay? Don't misunderstand me. But it seems like in the New Testament church, they understood that there was a difference between the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. And in order to experience the presence of the Holy Spirit, they would believe on Christ and they would be baptized. But in order to experience the power of the Holy Spirit, they would lay hands on them, and the power of God would come on that person, and they would preach with power. And in fact, these two different aspects, and I'm not trying to emphasize this idea of laying out of hands or anything like that, but I'm just saying, in the New Testament church, they seem to understand there is a difference between the presence and the power, and they had two different symbols for both of them, or one symbol for each, I mean. You understand what I'm saying? They recognized the distinction and that it was important, it was vital that we had both the presence of the Holy Spirit, which does that work, that transformation, the change of the heart, and then the power of the Holy Spirit, which equips us and empowers us for effective ministry. In fact, turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 5. I just want to show you how fundamental this concept was to the New Testament church. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, down near the end of the chapter. Paul is describing the condition of some of the believers in his day. And he says, you know, when, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles. Of the or you, you need someone to go over all the basics again with you. Just, just like a brand new baby, you need someone to go back over it all again. And then in chapter 6, he identifies what those basic foundational principles were of the New Testament church, kind of like their fundamental beliefs. Notice chapter 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the, the principles or the foundational principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into perfection or into maturity, not laying again, and then he lists them. Founda uh, the foundation of repentance from dead works, repentance, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, and what's the next one? Laying out of hands. There you see the two of them again, side by side. Laying out of hands. And then he mentions a couple more. Resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. He says, these are the basics. Baptism in the lake. The presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. This was basic. This was foundational to the New Testament church. The point is, the Holy Spirit is real. And the Holy Spirit can come into our meetings, into our presence, in a marked way. And we need to have the power of the Holy Spirit in our meetings, in our lives, in our ministries. We cannot be content with just the presence of the Holy Spirit. We must have the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, I've been to a lot of conferences and uh, camp meetings and visiting different churches. And we can run, and with all due respect to the organizers here, we can run very well organized programs. Everything can be structured and just run just right by the clock and, and have the best music and, and everything just run perfectly smoothly. 
and good presentations and good training and, and we get some good skills and we go home and we're motivated, inspired, and, and that's all fine. But something happens that's different when the presence of the Holy excuse me, the power of the Holy Spirit, you understand what I'm saying? You know, we can have the presence of the Holy Spirit in our meetings and we can go home and we can be blessed, but when the power of the Holy Spirit is poured out, something different is going to happen. I remember one time, this is probably the first time I ever saw the power of the Holy Spirit manifest. It was in my little home church. I was just a brand new Christian, less than a year old. And I was in my early 20s. And I, I don't remember, I just sort of vaguely remember, but we had a, a guest speaker come to our church. And I don't remember even what the occasion was. He, was a, he had been uh, raised in Cuba, had gone through different persecution, and, and, he, and, he, and he just gave the Sabbath morning message. And it was a very simple message. All I just vaguely remember is he was talking about how we need to be more loving, that there's people in our church that are hurting and broken, and we need to have the love of Christ. And I saw something I never saw before happen in that church. All of a sudden, while he was speaking, the power of God was poured out. And virtually every person in that congregation just started bawling their eyes out. It was real. I mean, it happened. I never saw it before. I never saw it after, at least not in that church. The power of the Holy Spirit came, and I don't know what was different about that, but I, I suspect it was because that speaker had spent time on his knees just pleading with God, and God blessed with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I remember not too long after that, I went to a camp meeting. I was uh, just attending, and they happened to have a, a guest speaker, a, the morning speaker, and he was talking about revival and reformation, how we need the Holy Spirit. And he gave a night, it was one of those 10-day camp meetings, he gave a really nice series of presentations on how we need more of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I happened to stumble across someone that was leading a little prayer group, and we'd go up on the hill every morning at 5 a.m., and we would just plead and agonize. I, I didn't know that most Christians don't normally do that. I just assumed you did that. You know, we'd get up early, and we'd go up and pray and just plead with God. And, and we started with just a little small group, like maybe four, five, six people. And as the week progressed, more and more people started coming. Pretty soon, we had three, four groups just meeting up there on the hill. Early in the morning, we out praying under the stars. Just wonderful experience. And it, when I, we could almost just, I could almost just sense our faith just reaching higher and higher and higher. The last morning of the camp meeting, same presenter was up giving the morning devotion. And he gave an appeal. And this was a big camp meeting. There were probably a thousand people there. I don't know. Many, several hundreds at least. He gave an appeal. And it was like the Holy Spirit just came on that congregation. And everyone just stood to their feet. And they just pressed towards the front. front. I don't think he was really expecting that. And he said, you know, we just need to pray. And the, and the whole group, a thousand people, imagine this big, gigantic auditorium, just broke out into spontaneous prayer. And different people would be praying. And I, I don't want to sound sensational or, or fanatical or anything like that. But in the middle of that prayer, I still remember this to this day. We heard this, you know, my eyes were closed, I had my head bowed. I still remember, all of a sudden we heard this loud, booming voice. And I don't know who it was. Someone said, you have been praying for me. I am here in your presence. And he and just gave a, a short message. It was like, when my character is reproduced in my people, you will see things you've never seen happen before. And it was just a short message. And the conviction of the power of the Holy Spirit just came on that kind of, And we just started, I remember I was just trembling from head to foot. Now, I don't know if you've ever experienced the power of the Holy Spirit poured out in your life. But I've had experiences like this here and there just on occasion over the years. Like one time I was... Uh, out at Weimar College, I was teaching there, and we planned a little retreat for our students. It was a beautiful campgrounds, and, and they had asked me to do some of the meetings for that weekend. And, I, and uh, we, this is actually when our fast ministry just very first began. We just had a small group of guys, and we'd meet early in the morning. We'd get together and pray and memorize our scriptures, and we were doing some training. Just back in the early days, a long time ago. I still remember this with so much fondness. And uh, over the course of the weekend, I was sharing some of the different things that God was laying on our hearts as a, as a team of, of young guys. And uh, that Saturday night, I gave a presentation. And it was about how we need the Holy Spirit and power. Talking about the early and the latter rain and, and some of those things. And, I, and I, it was just another presentation. I was just sharing and, and preaching my heart out, you know, as we do sometimes. Sometimes. 
And I was ready to call the meeting to a close and sit back down when all of a sudden, a young guy, a young college student, he got up in the back of the room and, he, and, he, and I could just see he was just shaking from head to foot. And he walked down to the front and says, i got to share something. Can I share something? Now, this was a little informal, okay? This was a little, you know, it wasn't that odd a thing. But he just came to, i got to share something. I said, okay, whatever. And I just stepped aside and I let him step up to the microphone. And, and he was literally just shaking. And he got up and he shared this testimony. He said, you know, the, the, what, what Dan has been sharing is just... It's so true. He says, when I was a young boy, I couldn't read. I had a problem. A learning pro- I could not learn to read. And someone encouraged me to just take the scriptures and try and start reading the Bible. And I started reading. As a, and I actually learned how to read just by spending time in the scriptures. And he, and he was just like under so much conviction. Because I had talked about the importance of the word of God in connection with the revival. And, and, and after he was finished just sharing, we, we got to get back to the Bible. He bolted out the door and just ran. I don't even know where he went. I thought, wow, that was strange. I was ready to come back up and close the prayer. And as I looked out, I noticed that there were people on the edge of their seats, like all over, like, like there were a whole bunch of people that wanted to come up. And I said, if there's someone else that wants to come up and share a testimony, just come on up to the front and, and I'll give you a chance. And all of a sudden, like half the group just went over to the side and they got in a long line. And, they got, and I, I didn't know what else to do. I just went down and sat down. So I remember sitting over there about where Brother Skeet is. And just sitting down there just watching. And I'm sitting next to some of the guys around our team. We're just looking at it because we had been praying for revival. We had been praying for revival. And for the next four hours till past midnight, we only had maybe 80 or so students there. For the next four hours, we had people just coming up. And they were just pouring out their hearts and just sharing. They, they were under so much conviction. They'd break down and start crying. And people would come up and start praying. And just, I'd never seen anything like it in my life. You know, I'm all for good organization and programs and structure, and and I'm so thankful that we have the presence of the Holy Spirit that's working. But you know what we really need? We need the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I could tell you many other stories, at least several others. In fact, uh, we just started a a class online. We have a little online training school. We have about 3,500 students around the world, lots from Australia, by the way. Appreciate that. And... uh, we started a, a conference online on the Holy Spirit, and uh, we had about 75 people participate in that first conference, and one of the questions was uh, if we kind of talked about some of these things, and I said, uh, how many of you have had experiences along these same lines? Just share an experience you've had, and you know, we just had person after person share one story. A lot of times it's just one occasion, one event, or maybe a couple times, but just like the, the, the testimonies that were shared were just amazing. The Holy Spirit is still alive and well today. The Holy Spirit is able to work not just in, in the small, soft, gentle ways that we're so accustomed to, the presence, of, but He's willing to come and work in power today. We need that power. I appreciated our convener last night reading this quotation from, uh, at least the reference I have, is Volume 1 of Selected Messages, page 122. I want to read it again. This has perhaps been the most convicting quote to me in the entire spirit of prophecy. And I've thought about this, and I've wrestled with this many, many times. The old standard bearers, the old pioneers of our church, they knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer and to enjoy the outpouring of His Spirit. They knew what it was to get down on their knees and just plead and agonize with God, maybe for hours, maybe spend the whole night just pleading with God, and they would actually experience the outpouring of the Spirit. They had the Holy Spirit work. They had the presence of the Holy Spirit, no question. The Lord was leading. The Lord was guiding. But they knew that there was something more they had to have. And they would just get on their knees, and they would plead with God until they actually experienced the power of the Holy Spirit. The old standard bearers knew what it was to wrestle with God in prayer and to enjoy the outpouring of His Spirit, but these are passing off from the stage of action. And who are coming up to fill their places? How is it with the rising generation? Do they know what it means to wrestle with God in prayer and to actually experience the power of the Spirit of God poured out? How is it with us? How is it with me? It's a pretty convicting question, isn't it? Do I really know what that is to wrestle with God and see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? 
page before that, that section on revival and reformation, it begins like this. A revival of true godliness among us, that rising, right? A revival of true godliness among us is the greatest and most urgent of all our needs. To seek this should be our first work. There must be earnest effort to obtain the blessing of the Lord, not because God is not willing to bestow His blessing upon us, but because we are unprepared to receive it. There's a work of preparation that has to take place before we can experience the power of the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is always around, always working, and I'm just so thankful for the mercy of God to give us the presence of the Holy Spirit. But He wants to come in power. But there's a work of preparation that has to be done. And if you read through that section, we don't have time to go into it tonight, but it talks about what that preparation is. There must be confession, humiliation, repentance, earnest prayer. The blessing will not come except in answer to fervent prayer. But we have to at least have some sort of consciousness, even if it's just a remote, distant sense. We have to believe that it's possible to have more. That our experience with the presence of the Holy Spirit is not all there is. If we don't believe that, how are we going to plead and pray and agonize before God? Because we want more. We'll be satisfied with what we have. Amen? It's not easy. I have a you know, I just started pastoring a few months ago. We have a nice little church. We have about 300 members, not all attending, but working on that. And we have lots of programs going, and we have lots of, we have some good leadership in that church, and all kinds of things are going, training and outreach and trying to get more going all the time, and we're just trying to tighten things up and get our program running better and better. But I have a guy there in my church. His name is Ed Gutierrez. And every time, he's constantly sending out these little memos, these little emails, reminding us how programs are not enough. We need the, present, the, the power. I keep saying the present. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. There has to be real conversion, real transformation, real heart searching, real agonizing with God. We can run all the programs just as nicely and as well organized as we want, but we have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Or we're just spinning our wheels I thank the Lord for Ed. He's a challenge to me. Constantly challenging me not to be content with the form, but not having the power. That same section there in Selected Messages, page 124. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance. So the Lord can pour out his spirit. If Satan had his way, she continues, there would never be another awakening, great or small, to the end of time. But we are not ignorant of his devices. It is possible to resist his power. Amen? When the way is prepared for the spirit of God, the blessing will come. When the hindrances are removed, when the obstacles are taken out of the way, Satan cannot prevent the Spirit of God from being poured out on his people, on God's people, with power. He cannot stop it. Can't. I love that quotation. It gives me hope. You see, what we really need in our lives is we need more power. We need power for real victory in our life. Not just the sensitivity, the conviction, I need to make changes, and yes, you know, I appreciate that, but we need power to make real change, transformation, victory in the life. We need it. And we need power for ministry, so we're not just going through the motions and doing the things that we know we should be doing and, and getting feeble, minimal, trivial results when we could be having the blessing of God on our ministries. And we're going to talk about Both of these aspects of power this weekend, power for victory, power for ministry. But right now, in these last couple minutes, I just want to focus on the urgency of our preparation. That's what we really need, is to prepare our hearts for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness fasting and praying and agonizing. And when he came back, he came back in the power of the Holy Spirit. The apostles, they spent 10 days in that upper room just praying and searching their hearts and pleading with God. And then the Holy Spirit was poured out without power, with power. There's a time of trial and testing and agonizing that goes between the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. If we want the power, we have to go through that time. Heart searching, agonizing, being honest and transparent before God and saying, God, what, what do you see? Search me, oh God, know my heart, try me, see if there be any, any wicked way in me. And, and this is why it's so hard. I think this is why we see the power of the Spirit so rarely today, because we're not willing to expose ourselves to the eye of God. Before Nehemiah could rise and build, as Brother Skeet reminded us last night, it says he sat down and mourned and wept and prayed certain days and he fasted for the God of heaven. He just poured out his heart and said, God, we need you. There's no other way around it. You can't get through from the presence to the power without that time of agonizing with God. Appreciate our conferences like this. I, I really do. But I wonder sometimes if we don't need to make just a little more room for the working of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is poured out without power, at least in my experiences, I've never seen the Holy Spirit poured out with power except there was deep conviction of sin. There's no other way. We have to be willing to open our hearts to God and say, God, what do you see? What is it that's the obstacle? What's the hindrance? What what is it in my life that I'm not quite willing to let go of? What is that little cherished thing that I keep rationalizing and justifying, but I know shouldn't be there in my life? Lord, what is it about my priorities that are just skewed to where my focus really isn't on you, it's on my career, my education? What, you know, Where am I off, Lord? i, I got to see the truth about myself. If you want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, there's no other way to experience that power unless you're willing to just open your heart to God and be willing to see what he has to show you. There's no other way. There's no other way. It's scary. It's scary to open our hearts to God. Because we all know in the nagging little back part of our mind, we, we know that things are not quite completely right and if we were to really be honest, really to be sincere, really to be completely transparent, and we could really see ourselves as God sees us, it would be an utterly painful experience. Thank the Lord he only shows us what we can bear, right? We really don't have anything to fear, but are we willing to, to see what we can see? Are we willing to go that far? True repentance. Tears. Unless we allow the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to the true condition of our heart, revival will not come. We won't have power to rise. We won't have power to build. Now let me just ask you a question. How many of you, I can barely see out a little bit, but how many of you want not just the presence. You've, you've had the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life for maybe some time, and, and you know that. But how many of you want more? You want the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Praise the Lord. Now, let me ask you one more question. How many of you are willing to pay the price for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Let me see your hand again. Now, you realize when you're raising your hand, what you're saying is, I want God to show me my true condition. I want God to show me my heart, my true need. I'm willing to make changes. I'm willing to have God just change me. I encourage you. I'm going to ask just a favor in closing. I want to encourage you. 
to spend some time alone with God. Even if you have to, you know, skip a meal or, or lose a little sleep or something, but get some time alone with God and just open your heart to the eye of God. May God bless each of you. Thank you.